Okay, awesome, guys. So uh, we are getting started with 2014, and I thought it would have been a great idea for me to reach out to you guys and, and give you kind of the catchy 14 things you must do for school owners. This also applies if you're an instructor or a coach or anybody who has a business. So I want to uh, move forward, and uh, for those who don't know me, I have actually some new friends who are on this webinar, just a little bit about myself here. Um, I do have uh, some martial arts experience. There's plenty of people who have more than I do, uh, but for those who are not familiar with me, I do have everything from a traditional background to more modern training. Uh, a lot of people do know me as a, a Muay Thai trainer, uh, but I do consider myself a traditionalist. I'm always a student, but I'm always trying to share the experiences. I'm very, very lucky to have uh, a, a nice variety of, let's call them a circle of friends who are very knowledgeable, very, very successful, and since I try and surround myself with just uh, the best people that I possibly can, it allows me to be able to do certain things that, that uh, I can pass on to you guys. Uh, I do work with many different types of businesses, whether they're uh, fitness industry or they could be in the medical industry, they could be in the martial arts industry, uh, but I think businesses are businesses and the way that you run them should be similar. If you have a system, the system should be rather universal. Uh, but I have worked with uh, traditional to uh, mixed martial arts camp facilities, whether they were nine, uh, I think the smallest one I had was 800 square foot dojo, and the largest one was a very, very large 20,000 square foot camp facility. So that's, that is uh, something I'm very happy and proud of. And I also have worked a lot with our licensed programs here at CRU. Here's a couple things that uh, I got from, actually a shout out to Tom Kalos' uh, success system, which is to know what you want and to have a plan with a success coach. It's kind of difficult to have a plan, make it up yourself and not really have a success coach uh, watching over you. And the third is to take consistent action because you could have a great idea, you could have a New Year's resolution, you could have, have all these wonderful things and three, four, five months down the line we all know what usually happens uh, because we're not following it and being consistent. And the last is whatever you're choosing to do, you you got to have some stats. You got to see whether that, that plan of action is actually working for you. And if it is working for you, uh, continue on and maybe exponentially grow it and if it's not working for you, you have to immediately halt what you're doing because the level of progression is actually going in the opposite way. So the next thing is uh, going on that success cycle is what do you want, what do you want for yourself, what do you want for other people, what do you want for your family? These are very, very simple questions but in a way do you ask this question every time you wake up? You know, I have my family over there on the right hand. Uh, my amazing wife, Christine, is very supportive of everything that I do, and my incredible daughter, DJ, uh, is always learning more and more of what daddy does, and I always want them to be proud of me. So some of the things that when I speak to school owners or instructors, they say very, very vague answers to what do they want. They'll say, I want more students, but there's no defining number for that. Uh, so if I said, hey, what do you need, what do you want for January? Well, I want more students. Well, how many? As much as I can get. Well, if it's that vague uh, of a solution, uh, of an answer, your blueprint to be able to get that answer or that solution is going to wind up being very vague as well. So you have to refine those answers a little bit more down. Do you want to teach less if you have more students? Do you want to have more locations? Do you want to have more... Uh, time away from the business and teaching because you don't want the first time that you get away from your business is because of an injury or God forbid something happens as an emergency in your family and the time that you actually have to leave your business it was not ready to be left you did it out of emergency and a lot of things will start to collapse so the first thing that I want you to note in the 14 things is to really find out not only just what you want but distill it down to as detailed um, as a detailed uh, itemized line item as possible to the point that you have very, very specific ways of getting that actionable thing. The second thing is to update your business plan. Uh, I can't tell you how many people that I talk to within business and they have no business plan or they just look at me and they say, uh, it's different now. Well, great. You spent a lot of time originally creating your business plan. However, now that it's different, you don't write it down. You just know in your head that whatever it is that you have to do is what you have to do. Problem with that is you're the only one who has any idea what you're doing. You need to have your team, your management, your, um, your followers understand what direction you're taking it, especially if you've changed direction. Uh, 
So one of the best things that you have to do is not only create your business plan, but make sure that you have someone guiding you into what that plan should be. And as I said before, does it have enough details as, as it should? So that blueprint should include things such as your short-term goals, your long-term goals, and just staying consistent, staying the course. At what point, if you have a marketing strategy and you spend X amount of dollars towards a direct mailer, how many months have to go by on that direct mailer? If you do not have success in that, do you wind up evaluating, you know what, I'm not going to spend any more money in this. I have to invest it into something else. Or do you just do it for the heck of doing it and you wish that it would get better or you don't fine tune it? Maybe the, the direct mail works. It's just the offer you put on the direct mail piece wasn't compelling enough for people to uh, take action. Uh, same thing, uh, uh, social media doesn't work for me. Well, maybe the social media pieces that you put out there um, are kind of the same thing over and over again, or it's not compelling enough for people to do anything. So you have to kind of look at that, reevaluate it, see if it works. Don't give up on a marketing strategy per se. You have to give up on the method that that strategy is actually being executed. And if you're the one designing everything, maybe you have to fire yourself from being the designer and have somebody else do it who might have a little bit more success or experience in that field. You also, in your business plan, have to figure out, listen, there's going to be some consequences for failure. Uh, I have some people who are out there and they'll say, hey, I'll try this and I'll spend this or I'll spend amount of, this amount of time or I'll hire this person. And it doesn't work out. And you kind of have the same lifestyle, the same spending, the same um, expenditure, and you wonder where everything is going. At the end of the day, if something didn't work, it's got to come out from somewhere else. So you got to have consequences for this. If, if you want uh, a new car for your business, you will not get it unless this particular thing, uh, we'll call it a marketing strategy, works and generates X amount of money. You don't do it just because it's your birthday. Uh, at the same time, if something didn't work, something that you may consider as a luxury, you might have to reduce it. So you have to consider all the different consequences in case of something failing, not just in case in, in case uh, a plan goes right. A lot of times failure is good because it at, le at least lets you know what is the barometer and the health of your business. And when you see something fail, you can learn from that lesson. Quickly moving on to number three is to review your stats. And uh, over and over again, I got to tell you again, I'll talk to school owners or business owners. It doesn't really make a difference. They'll look at me and say, well, what stats do I want to see? And the first question I have back is, well, what stats do you have? And they'll always say they have to check. If this is your business, there is nothing that you need to check. If you have X amount of clients, you know that. If you have X amount of people inquiring and is a lead, you should know that. If that is your business, you should know that. If you have a staff member who's in charge of that, that staff member should do it. If you ask a staff member who's a manager and you say, how many, uh, how many leads converted over into uh, regular clients, if they have to look it up, they're not doing their job. If they don't know what the delinquency report is, they're not doing their job. That's actually their only job. And you have to compare those stats to not yesterday's or just daily's, but also weekly and monthly's. Now, we're going into the end of, well, we're in the middle of January, going into the middle, going to the end. Do you have stats from last year's January so that at least you can compare this month compared to last month? And if there's something dramatically different, can you actually say why it's different? And if you just say, oh, the economy, well, what about the economy? Did the, did the economy change the way you marketed, so you marketed less, so you got less? Or you actually spent more money, and you actually got less? There's a lot of different ways to be able to look at stats. And again, one of those things are, are you the best qualified person to judge those stats? Stats doesn't have to mean money. Stats could mean how many people visited your site, and you've never changed your site, so therefore maybe it's time to change that. Uh, on the right-hand side, you're going to see, um, are you including social media within your stats? So if you have Instagram and Pinterest and Twitter, are your followers exactly the same followers that you had last year? If so, you're marketing the exact same thing that you did last year to the exact same eyeballs. And in a way, that really doesn't make sense. And they're going to think that you're a one-trick pony. So you got to keep changing that up as well and have your stats kind of change. You might have a 1,000 followers, but are they the same 1,000 followers? Or did you drop some and gain some, which is actually not bad. Because if you gain some, then at least uh, you have some fresh new eyeballs and certain marketing led them to watch you. And if you drop some, well, maybe those people were never really good 
leads to begin with that you should be sharing your content with. And uh, again, if you have tons of trouble, our mentoring program is something that can be able to help you with that. Or if you have someone local that could be a mentor to you, uh, definitely seek them out. Don't wait till the end of the year. This is the best time for you to be able to get started. Number four is to implement surveys. Remember, as uh, someone who can consider themselves as a business owner, maybe you're even the manager, uh, uh, owner and manager, you almost can't do anything wrong. You, you could be late for work and no one's going to yell at you. Or if you don't do your stats, no one's going to yell at you. Or um, you know whether you hire someone or fire someone, you're, you're the end all. But at the end of the day, when you give the surveys, it's to see how your business is, how your um, product is from other people's eyes. So who do you give the surveys to? Realistically, do you survey the staff? Do you survey um, former members? Uh, so technically, every time somebody doesn't continue with you, do you have a very strong survey to find out what is it that uh, compel them to quit? And even though they're going to quit, uh, what is it that they would recommend to other people? So that is a strong point. Or things that they would like to see changed so that you can constantly improve your product and service. And then once you get the surveys back, you pass them all out, it's great, and then they keep them in a folder. Realistically, how do you interpret all of these surveys to help you? You know, there's some pretty interesting shows out there like Secret Shoppers or Undercover Boss. I think there was one called Mystery Diner, and I, I kind of laugh because it is entertainment, but at the end of the day, we become so judgmental and smart, and we say, how could that owner let that happen? And uh, it's pretty simple. They never looked at it from a third party. They always looked at it as they're part of the conversation. They see the same thing every single day, so nothing changes. You'd be surprised. You have somebody else walk into your business. They're going to notice whether the, the garbage is uh, halfway full and it wasn't taken out, or if the air fresheners aren't, weren't on point, or um, you know the gym or mats weren't as clean as they could be. You see it every day. You walk by it, and you kind of get used to seeing it. Somebody else might say, hey, you know what, you need a paint job on those walls. So these are the things that you need to make sure you have checklists for, surveys for, and have other people input on your business if you cannot remove yourself and treat it like a third party. If it wasn't your business, it was somebody else's, you probably see yourself treating it completely different. Uh, the next one is if you haven't started reading uh, good books, I don't mean a Harry Potter book or a Hunger Games book. I'm talking about real books that deal with people who are very, very successful. Uh, please, please implement that, whether it's on your Kindle or Reader or whatever it turns out to be, and start compiling them. I mean, whether there's a biography of Steve Jobs or um, a company like Walmart or Starbucks or uh, you know, books like Think and Grow Rich or The E-Myth, here's the thing. Everyone's going to say, oh, I did that. Well, maybe you have to do it again. Maybe you have to do it slower. Maybe you have to do it with more experienced eyes. So things that you've done before may not be things that can get interpreted the exact same way. It's like watching a movie. If you watch a movie, the second time you saw it, you might catch a couple different things that you missed the first time. So the other thing that you can do is after you read them is to start to discuss it with other business owners and see how you can implement it. So you read it. Congratulations. You read it in two days. You're done. You're reading the next book. But you haven't actually let it absorb and interpret into a point where you're executing on the lessons learned from that material. So kind of think about that. At the same time, if you are a fitness guru or you happen to have clients who are uh, taking martial arts with you, uh, do you have standard reading for them? Whether you create your own ebook. So here's an assignment for you that's part of our mentoring program is I want you by the time um, January ends, you've created at least two different ebooks. Maybe it's really about uh, some of the best exercises to get you um, ready for training in your facility or things to watch out for. Uh, maybe it's eating habits. Maybe it could be anything. But start writing something. And if people have a challenge writing, it's probably because they need to read more. Start to be able to borrow from what other people are saying. And that might come out into the way that you speak your vocabulary, your rhythm, your timing. So your favorite authors will become the same kind of way that you're going to wind up writing yourself. And then you watch shows like uh, Shark Tank or The Prophet, which uh, they have new seasons that are coming out. They're always fun to watch because what always happens is the people who appear there always seem to be having the same mistakes. And you laugh at them and you say, oh, I can't believe that guy went in there. Put yourself in that same situation. At one of our last training sessions, we kind of had a hot seat in which we had people pitch me and some of the other coaches 
their service, their product, their school, their business. And there's all, what, what's always best is the first time that you talk about it, the second time, the third time, you're kind of stuttering. You're, you're second guessing what you should say. The flow comes out different. But the more times that you do it, the better you get at it. And the better you get at it, the more believable you are. And if you can sound really believable about your product, at the end of the day, that means you know it up and down, back of your hand, and people will feel more confident in trusting you because you've done it before. If you have to talk about your product and you're really not sure how to describe it that well, or it's too vague and it doesn't really uh, uh, get the understanding on the other side, train it, craft it, fix it, and then do it again, do it again, do it again. Contact me if you want to pitch me. Uh, I'll be glad to set aside some time and we'll be able to talk about your business and see, hey, some of the things that you mentioned, you didn't have to talk about, but th this other thing, I think you should talk about that and make that a little bit more part of your mission statement, make that a little bit more of what your vision is, and get the other side really, really excited. The next thing in the 14 things for 2014 is get back into training yourself. Uh, start fresh, it's January, I hate to do the resolution thing, but that has nothing to do with it. It's really more like you gotta just get in there, whether you're a martial artist and you do traditional uh, karate, you wanna go in there and start doing you know, weapons training or grappling training or Muay Thai training or just, um, you know, do some lifting. Change it up, whether it's something similar of what you've always done, but now you got to go back and maybe you have a different instructor giving you um, some coaching or you do something that you've never done before. You were never a runner. You were never a, a strength and conditioning guy. Uh, so now you want to do functional training. You may want to just do that just to kick start and actually uh, create some passion back in yourself. And then when you start training with your students, the passion is going to be flowing through you and into the students. And all of a sudden, they get excited. And when the students are excited, the classes are really exciting. Uh, so you know, if you want to mix up a little bit of your, of, of your own regimen, just contact me for dates. I'll give you my contact information. Um, we have uh, Crew Muay Thai coach training that's coming up. We have a Muay Thai retreat weekend, which is for anybody. For those that want to add grappling, let us know. Uh, we have training dates for curriculum for that, uh, as well as a great new boxing program uh, that we're launching this year as well, uh, actually in Atlantic City. Going further on number six, which is uh, part of the training, is continuing education. And if that continuing education wasn't physical, like I just mentioned, that continuing education might be on the business and entrepreneur side. Uh, many people have gone to college, and maybe their college uh, training had nothing to do with a master's in business administration. Uh, it might be some, something completely different. So you may want to either get refresher courses or just do some real world training. Now the thing with real world training is you might have to do five or ten years worth of bad stuff to figure out how to do all the good stuff. So again, this is where a mentor uh, or working with other people and collaborating comes in handy because our learning curve uh, is just so much better. Uh, the thing that most people hate uh, especially uh, people who've been around the block here, is the technology training. If they're not used to software, if they're not using social media or implementing it, at the end of the day, you can delegate that out. But don't ignore the fact that you need it. You may not be the most um, uh, advisable person on that for all of your staff. There could be somebody else who can be in charge of social media. But you have to at least know that it's there what one will be best for you, how you should be using it, how you should be regulating it. Because the other thing that you have to make sure is if you let staff members handle social media, you have to make sure that their behavior and etiquette in social media is top notch according to your standards as well. So please do that as further your uh, continuing education. Don't be the guy that says, I've been training for 40 years in martial arts, but it really was, you know, after their first degree, they just keep repeating themselves. They haven't really tried to grow from there. And uh, if that is the case, a lot of students can see through you and they know that you're stopping. So it's very difficult right now in the adult industry. Uh, it's not about the sales and the brochures and the artwork to be able to get and keep adults. It's about actually having some substance. And if they see what they like, then they're willing to stay with you and pay for it. If they don't, then they're going to leave. Now, something else is there's some people who live and die for years and years with the same old thing. So for example, if you're a martial arts school and you cater to a lot of, uh, I don't know, five, seven, ten-year-old kids, 
and then you do a lot of birthday parties as your uh, additional income, you may want to start looking at different things. You don't want the fact that people aren't spending more on birthday parties and staying home and being a little bit more frugal, and all of a sudden you say, well, I just wish they did birthday parties. No, you got to have a little bit more eggs in your basket. So whether it's changing up the times, whether it's morning and lunchtime classes, whether you have more personal training sessions, a lot of martial arts schools don't offer them at, well, uh, at all. So you may want to train a secondary staff to actually just worry about personal training sessions. That doesn't mean the owner has to do it. That means somebody has to start doing it. Uh, have some asymmetrical programs. What I mean by asymmetrical programs is if you already have a traditional karate program, you may want to do something like a fitness kickboxing program. Or if you're a jiu-jitsu school, you may want to add a Muay Thai program. You don't want to add a karate program and from that karate program add a, add a similar looking self-defense program. You want to make sure that you have a much wider net casting out so that people don't just think that you're a one-trick pony. It's like, oh, that's a school that does all the birthday parties. No, that's, you'll wonder why you never get adults. So if you're able to do that, that's one of the most important things you could do for adding revenue streams is to add something that's more of an asymmetrical program. With having additional programs, that means your pro, shops, uh, pro shop strategies will be able to change as well. And as you do that, you got to report. Just because you wanted to add Zumba doesn't mean it's going to change your school. You got to find out, well, if I add 20 students, how many is that worth versus a martial arts program? Is the value, the overall value, not the number of people, worth it? Okay, you have more people, but they're paying less, and they don't do anything as far as upgrades. They don't do uniforms. They don't do pro shops. So you have a lot of people paying less, and there's no additional revenue streams from there. That's up to you to find out whether or not it's worth to continue a program like that or not. Other things that you could do, and it's very simple for additional revenue streams, is it might not have to do with your actual school. You don't have two mats, so if you're rocking and rolling, you can't have too many different programs. But you can actually resell other programs. There are things such as you know the software, there are training programs, there are licenses, there are things in the martial arts, and just by using your contacts, you'll be able to make commissions because you're recommending programs that you use within your school and have other like-minded people using it as well. So if you wanted things like to become a reseller, and add that because you have some dead times um, in your day and you wish you had something else that you could be doing but you wanted to keep it within the martial arts, contact me uh, because everything from the crew Muay Thai program, uh, combat submission wrestling, boxing program, software, marketing, things like that, um, you're talking to people online anyway, you're working with other business owners, you might as well be able to um, learn a product and be able to benefit from it as well, not just from your students but from outside your school. Number eight, evaluate your staff. Okay, now, I have a lot of uh, clients and they say, I don't really have much staff. I don't really have anybody else to talk to. Well, you know what? Evaluate yourself then. And this is the point I was making. Uh, you, you can talk to the guys who teach at, at my location and it's kind of like a double-edged sword. I guess they like it when I teach class, but they also know that I might teach over one hour. So I know I'm one of those guys that will teach, and I, I love teaching so much that I may go a little bit overboard, and in a one-hour class, I might go an hour and 10 minutes or whatever it turns out to be. So I fired myself. I said, you know what? I'm not the best guy to teach the regular one-hour class. I fired myself and have somebody who can always start on time, end on time, teach the curriculum, keep everyone happy. Uh, shout out to Crew Joe uh, for teaching the classes over at Crew Training. And because when I go in there, I love teaching workshops, I love teaching seminars, I love teaching on the side, but I want to make sure that everybody's happy and they get what they pay for and they expect everything consistently. So I, I have other people doing things uh, in my program because they're the best suited for it and that's what you have to find out for yourself. Uh, be careful, when you, when you do grow and you need staff, you may not have one prepared, so what usually happens is, uh, you get a ton of new students, you did something amazing with marketing, now you have them, now you're forcing someone to answer the phone and do intros, and they're not ready. It's kind of, you got them hired quickly because you need them, but they weren't prepared properly. So be very careful about that, and you don't want to micromanage that. You want to make sure that they get eased into it slowly, and make sure that uh, they do the job because they're ready. So you may want them to intern before you even hire people. Uh, the next thing is, uh, you got to change your look, okay? Uh, on the left was the whole baggy jeans look back in the day, uh, and on the right, for some reason, uh, skinny jeans became popular. Uh, 
I, my calves don't work with skinny jeans, so I just don't wear that. And that combination uh, of colors is just not something that I would wear. But uh, you got to change your look some, sometimes. So if you've always had the same sign in the front of your window, you may want to change it. If you've always had the same special, it's not special if it's always the same special. Um, maybe the colors got to change, your t-shirts and uniforms maybe change. Uh, it's all about your branding. It's all about your look. Uh, how you look on the outside may be the exact same thing, but you did $10,000 worth of renovation inside. Well, no one knows if they're walking by. They have to actually go inside first. So maybe you have to work from the outside in, and that could be your internet. That could be the outside window dressings. That could be new awnings and signage, whatever that turns out to be. And uh, start to update that. And if anybody wants to contact me, you could definitely do that. That's part of the program. Uh, but if you're visiting and this is the first time you're on one of my webinars, um, we will try and be able to work with you as long as we know what your vision is and, and kind of keep it consistent with that. How many of you actually have a student or employee handbook? Um, rifling through this rather quickly is uh, if you worked in any standardized uh, big box business, the reason that you have it is so that nobody thinks that you're making it up as you go along. So for example, do you know whether or not which holidays you're going to be open or closed? Are you definitely open? I'm sorry, are you definitely closed on Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve? and Or is it the whole week that you're going to be closed? So instead of changing it back and forth, this kind of lets you know what is your standard. And even if employees are going to wind up, I don't know, having a sick day, how is that allocated out? So by having an employee handbook is going to be very helpful. And if you understand that concept, having a student handbook would be helpful. Do the students know if they miss a class, what is the protocol in calling out? Do they understand the protocol if they go on vacation, what they should do? How do they alert us? Do they think they're supposed to be credited time? A lot of these things shouldn't just be an FAQ online. These are things that they're given upon enrollment, and they can refer to it so that when, you, when um, you give someone a late fee for not paying, they'll say, sir, it was part of your handbook, and, and this is something that you were alerted to. And maybe when they first sign up, uh, in the agreement, you could have a little box that they can initial saying that they have received their student handbook and they understand all the terms in there. So these are things that, again, I can't make it for you. Everybody has different rules. But I can definitely help you create it so that you can custom tailor it for whatever your business turns out to be. So all of your policies, your discounts. When I say hidden fees, some people will join a martial arts school and they think it's great. Hey, I'm paying $150 a month for 12 months. Awesome. And then Three months later, they get hit with a test fee. Realistically, did you know, did they know that there was supposed to be a test fee? So all of these things can be included in there. Um, in an employee handbook, you can have a morality clause in which if you have a student kind of speaking badly, uh, not just about the school, but their behavior is a little bit suspect online. They could be an angel um, you know, while they're working for you, but outside, they feel like they can say whatever they want. Well, they represent your school, and you have to be careful with that. And if you're going to terminate someone based upon that, that should be one of the policies that you can refer to. Now, the collaboration, it always makes sense. Uh, we have Crew Nation that we have all these people try and connect with. Now, saying that you're going to collaborate, saying that you're going to connect, saying that you're going to communicate doesn't actually mean you do it. Liking a page or liking a comment isn't collaborating. You need to actually get down and talk about real subjects and make, make the execution actionable. So a lot of successful companies work together. They develop these strategic partnerships. Uh, and by having kind of this open forum, they can find out who do I want to work with, who, who do I not want to work with. Because a lot of people, unfortunately, they will judge you based upon um, who you are, who you work with, who you run with. And they think that somebody else's policies that's a friend of yours is something that you accept as well. And honestly, it probably does. So the people who are around you, you have to be very, very careful. You may have to cut loose a couple people. I know some very, very good students who are great students, but they would be horrible employees. And people who would represent us in one way, they can't represent us in another way. So think about that. Uh, if you haven't been, um, or if you're not connected to me socially, such as Facebook or things like that. Not, don't just connect with me. See if you can get notifications so that we can, if there's a topic that I happen to bring up and you want to elaborate a little bit more, that we could be able to do that through private messaging or, or through our mentoring groups. Uh, the next one, speaking of social media, is to step it up. I see some people and they'll have 
Uh, I don't know. They'll have a Twitter account, but it has like three tweets. At the end of the day, whether you opened up uh, an Instagram, you could have that Instagram, whatever you put on Instagram, automatically go to your Twitter. And why would you do that? Because uh, I actually can say that I have more people who actually have a Twitter account than they have an Instagram account. So even though I'm putting it on Instagram, I'm sharing it across different media platforms. So with that plug, uh, if you don't have an Instagram, grab one. It actually works pretty well. I have a conversation um, with a, a very, very good trainer out there, um, Darren Goodall. I'm going to shout you out. And he's really done well with his clients actually just by using uh, his Instagram and proper use of hashtags and meeting more people. So please step that up. Add me uh, on Instagram. It's Crew Ace Ramirez. Make sure that you uh, add me, and uh, I'll follow you back. Now, here's the other thing. You can have all the social media platforms in the world. The one thing you have to do is assume the role that you want everybody to have. So if you're an expert at martial arts, can you not have 90% of your stuff uh, of your dog on Instagram? Or, you know, like, oh, look at the bunny. He's jumping. It's very cute. You could have that account. You could have a school account. You could have a business account. You could have whatever. But kind of stay consistent about that. Now, every once in a while, yes, you will see something uh, about my daughter. Uh, on my Instagram, but the reason I do that is I'm trying to show how proud I am of her and maybe it has something to do with parenting because at the end of the day, we, do, we deal with kids, we deal with parents, and we'll somehow try and relate it. Don't just throw up a quote uh, and not see how it can relate to anybody. Uh, if something bad happened to you, you don't have to use social media to say how upset you are. Well, you're upset. The more that you get comments about you being upset, you're going to have a hard time letting it go. So you might as well just be upset, let it go, and kind of connect with somebody about something a little bit more positive. Um, something else is have your Facebook friends changed or your Twitter friends changed. This was something that I posted recently. I kind of said, hey, I'm, I've reached my 5,000 person limit. And if I haven't, it wasn't a matter of you liking or commenting that time or that day. It was a matter of if I noticed that you haven't been liking or commenting over the last year, and I go through all the members and friends, and I say, wow, I, I can't even remember who this person is. Yeah, I start to delete them, and I would make room for people who actually want to engage in conversation or follow me in what I'm doing. So here's one thing that I actually would encourage you guys to do. Do a little bit more than view a page. Actually do a little bit more than liking a page or liking a comment. Actually comment on the post. Tell them what you liked or didn't like. Um, it's kind of weird. I, I would see a post and, and somebody unfortunately would pass away and then there would be a like. I don't even know what that's supposed to mean. Somebody passed away and they, and they click like. What does that mean? Write down your condolences. Tell them you know, if there's anything you can do for them. Interact in that way. Don't just make it as a passerby because liking is great, but at some point it actually doesn't say anything. Um, so make sure, especially if you're a business owner, uh, sometimes – Especially for me, the people who comment and like on my posts are other business owners. Well, that's great. Uh, I think one of my area of concentration is to get my students to follow me and to comment and like. And one thing I have not done so much is every time there are uh, it's a new student, well, you can like them. And you know, you wouldn't be like you're stalking them. And this is one of those things where they could say, you know, follow us for the news. So whether you're guiding them to your Facebook page uh, for the business or your personal one, this is again the whole reason, you know. If you're going to put yourself in the limelight out there, you have to show yourself as the expert. You can't start showing them things that are completely unrelated because they're going to unfollow you and they're not going to find it very, very uh, important in their life to care what you're doing. And at the end of the day, if this is your business, everything that you do in your life has to do with the business and has to connect with them. Now, examining other businesses, uh, some people can call it um, checking out the competition, but not everything is competition. You could actually just go into you know, to the mall and see how a uh, retail store sets up their retail displays. And you could say, wow, that's a great looking display, the way they did the mannequin, the way they showed their t-shirts, isn't that? I should put that in my pro shop. So one thing that you can do is just to be able to get inspired. You know, go to other places, go to other businesses, just get inspired. It has nothing to do with stealing anything, but in a way that's flattery as well. Now it goes. Now you can go down to, hey, you know, the martial arts school down the block. Well, what is examining that? Well, what is their specials? What do they get for the specials? It's not about the prices. It's about what the benefits are. So you could be able to see um, uh, what they're doing, model what you like, and the things that you don't like, uh, 
I'm sorry, the things that you do like, start going to other people and saying if they like it too, because just because you like it doesn't mean other people will like it. Doing a flying sidekick to someone's head over a car might seem cool to some people at one point in time, but to others it's just not a, it's not a big deal. Um, so we're not the experts in that, so we have to take our personality, our take our vision, and then bring that to other people and see whether or not they would be buying into that as well. So you have to think with the end in mind. I'll give you an example, you know, uh, as a parallel to martial arts or fitness schools, things like that, who would have figured going to a dance school would be a competitor? Well, at the end of the day, they teach group lessons, they teach private lessons. Uh, it is a service. Uh, there could be monthly reoccurring fees. And so therefore, and, and for kids, you know, they, they technically have uniforms. They have certain things that they buy for their recitals. So I consider that somewhat of a parallel to us and, and to see what they do. And what they charge could either show us as being too expensive because we don't offer as much as they do, or we could say we're a great deal, or maybe we're not charging enough because we're giving them way more benefits than what they're doing. So that's, that's also another barometer to see how you're doing within your business. Uh, number 14, obviously, get a mentor. Uh, my definition for a mentor is really finding somebody who is at a place where you want to be, but used to be where you are right now, right? You can't really, there's certain people you just can't relate to because they have nothing to do with you. Uh, it doesn't, they don't necessarily always have to be in the same business to be a mentor, but they have to realistically have the similar starts and understand where you want to go and be realistic in the timeline. So if one of your mentors always had money and they always had um, financing for every project they wanted to do and they always had a team and you're like, but I don't have money and I don't have a team, um, it might be a little bit more difficult. So you may want to find someone a little bit closer to where you're at. So to be a Ronin is a masterless warrior and to be separate and independent, sometimes that's why you opened up your business. But at the end of the day, that's not what great businesses do. Uh, they really have to collaborate. They have to talk to other CEOs. They have to be able to talk to other managers and see what they're doing and, and switch that out. So that's really, really important for you to be able to consider. Now, if you've never done it before, you probably heard it before. I'm not here to pitch anything, uh, although I have talked about some of the things that, that I've worked with, uh, with my coaches right now. But something really brand new, and it's actually getting started right now, is there is an elite alliance, and it's not just me. There's a great team involved. Uh, there's myself and there's Shihan Mike Vaca, uh, who runs multi schools. We have Professor Ricardo Almeida, who is an amazing uh, leader uh, and, and, and specialist in what he does in his jiu jitsu world. And we also have Sensei Nick Doherty, who's done amazing things with Mr. Marketer and things with Champions Way, everything from SEO, SMO, all the way down to social media. He's basically a ninja when it goes down to that. Um, the reason I'm showing you this is uh, we, we have a lot of people involved in that. I just want you to understand the difference between what mastermind groups are and what mentoring groups are. Um, I'm going to actually give you a couple tips after this, so don't think that I'm pitching you anything right now. I'm giving you some tips after this, but there are four live meetings. That's all there are, four meetings. You have to show up. It's $500 a month, not $500 for four meetings. It's $500 a month, 12 months for these four meetings, and you have to be pre-qualified. So if you have you know, 50 clients, one location, and you're the only staff member, don't join this. This is probably not best for you. What you might want to consider if you have a more startup business or you don't have a business or you want to grow the business is you could do a crew mentoring program and out of the 14 things you must do in 2014, we go into in-depth not only that but many, many more things as well and it is less than half the cost than the elite program. So it's supposed to be $250 a month and it is $250 a month but for the webinar there's going to be more of a discount. Uh, a webinar discount here and you'll be getting social media training you're going to get de developing operational calendars which is really important that people need business entity protection finance strategies statistic reporting and weekly assignments with accountability partners so let me leave that alone I'm just gonna pass I just want to let you know those existed I, what I want to do right now is go into some mentoring um, tips and questions that we would normally do as part of the group so hopefully you can jump on this right now um, Think about this. Mentoring question is what kind of business entity are you? Whether you're in the fitness, medical, martial arts, whatever, you're either a sole proprietor, uh, an LLC, or a corporation. So if you are a corporation, which one? Are you an S or a C? And when you did that, do you even know the difference of why you did an LLC versus a corporation versus a sole proprietorship? Now, can, can it be safe to say 
uh, that most of the people here are not sole proprietors, and I'll tell you why. Sole proprietors don't have a tax ID number. Sole proprietors actually use as your business ID your social security number. With that being said, that means, God forbid, something ever happens. You're holding pads, somebody gets hurt. They're holding pads, they get hurt. They're doing push-ups, they get hurt. They will go after you personally and all of your personal assets. Uh, so I spoke to someone recently, and I said, well, of course you're not a sole proprietorship, right? And I, I'm, I'm thinking, of course they're not, and they actually said, no, we are. And I said, "How? You know, that's a little bit risky. Uh, you shouldn't do that. So let's say that's a very, very basic question. Let me ask you this. You got to convert immediately, by the way, if you're a sole proprietor, but at least know the difference between the LLC and the corporations and why you're going to do that. So this follows into my second question. If you have one business, for example, you, you have a martial arts school, so you have one business. Should you open one legal business entity? So like you said, you know, okay, I have a business and I've converted into an LLC. The question that I have to ask you is, are you interested in protecting your personal assets? Everybody, please type yes. should be amazing. That's a, that's, that's a no-brainer, sir. You know, this is not compelling information. I don't know what you're talking about. All right, so here's my next answer for that, what kind of business do you have? How many people out there are proud of themselves if you answered you had one business entity, such as an LLC, for your one business or martial arts location? Okay, let me just open up this box a little bit. Boom. Just seeing some of these answers. Cool. Okay, so here's my next part. If you want to grow and protect your assets, you're wrong if you have one business and one entity. You should have two business entities to protect your single operation. Does anyone at all not know what I'm talking about? Please type something. Hmm. Okay, great. All right, let's see if I can explain this in a very simple way. <clears throat> Sometimes guys like Donald Trump, and I hate to be online and talk about that, has probably gotten into trouble once or twice uh, in the past, yet you know, he, he's still standing. And the reason for that is if you have one business and one entity, then basically every, everything is in that entity and people still can come after it. Not only is it expensive, uh, to defend it, even if you're right, can we agree that even if you are right, someone can still sue you, and it would cost you an arm and a leg just to say, throw that out. It's it's not even important. So what happens is, you want to have one entity that op that has all of your operational stuff. So you have you collect all of your tuition. It goes into your first entity, and let's say your operating expenses are ten thousand dollars a month but you happen to generate $20,000 a month. Well, that would be cool. You make, you make that much profit. Excellent. Do you, you don't want to keep all of your net income in that one company. What you want to do is you have the one company that have to handle all of your operations. The money comes funneling in into company number one. Now, you pay your rent, you pay your utilities, you pay your taxes, you pay um, your employees, the whole nine. And you know that it's ten thousand dollars, but you 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 bill them uh, twenty thousand dollars. You have this extra ten thousand dollars that now goes into company number two, which is technically a holding company. So now maybe I've jogged your memory. Now you've said, hey, you know, I've heard of that before, a holding company. Well, if you own a business, a holding company owns that asset. All the net income, that money goes into that business. Maybe you have tons and tons of uh, equipment. You have boxing ring, you have weights, you have this. Well, if someone sues you, they can take that equipment from you. Well, no, that equipment is owned by this other holding company. So the first company is almost a pass-through. So the first company is almost like a plane. Uh, the money comes in, the plane touches down, the wheels touch the ground, and then it takes off again. So that money comes in, and it just simply bounces out to wherever it needs to go. Maybe 80% of that will go to your bills, and the other 20% of it goes to your holding company. Does that make sense? If, if I lost anybody, let me know, but please uh, let, get some interaction here and let me know that people are understanding this. This is very important. So two entities for one business. So if you have two different businesses, well, same thing. 
the whole point is to the, the holding company is to protect it and the other one is just kind of like what's in the public eye. This is how most people will be able to protect it. Now, what does that actually mean? Well, don't lawyers know that you're just putting it in one company and the other? Yes, they do. And if they find out that you're smart enough to do it, they don't even bother suing you because they know you're protected. So when you have one company, they will go after you. Why? Because they know where everything is. If you have two companies, they say, oh, you know what? They have the structure down. They've protected themselves. It's going to cost them way more money to try and go after you. And at the end of the day, they're still not going to get anything. So what do they do? They don't even bother. So this may help you um, somewhere down the line. God forbid something like that has, you know, may happen. Why am I talking about this? Well, guess what happened? Something bad happened one time at his school. So it didn't involve me. It involved a staff member, so of course it's my liability. And the way I was structured, I was wide open to get hurt. Good thing nothing happened, but I didn't just wipe my eyebrow and say, good thing nothing happened. I kind of tried to get the, you know, the bulletproof vest on and try and find out and educate myself. And trust me, learning this the long way, the hard way, the more expensive way, I'm trying to give you the, some of these details way before it may ever happen to you. So hopefully just this alone might be something that uh, was helpful for you today. Uh, let's go into another one. Let's go into a mentor question. Uh, how many people have good business credit? Let's, let's get some answers here, some interaction. Or even better, how many people have a business credit card? And if you do, write down the kind of business credit card. Don't worry, I won't tell anybody what it is. You're not giving me your account number unless you want to, but you can just put some of that down. Well, that's a great question. Somebody says, how do I know if my credit is good? Well, that's, that's, you, there's two ways to look at it. Are you asking if your personal credit is good or are you asking if your business credit is good? And I will answer that in a second. I just want to see if anybody actually has business credit cards. Okay, I have one person saying, I have good personal credit. Let me see. I have good, good personal credit. I only have a business debit card. Okay, so a business debit card is not what I mean. That's just a way for you to be able to pay for stuff. So let me let me give this as an example. <clears throat> if you have an American Express credit card and the name on it has your name and underneath it it has the business name, technically, you yes, it is a business credit card, but you do not gain business credit from it. I will repeat that. If your credit card has your name on it and it also has that other, you know, your, the name of your business, like uh, John's House of Kicks, to open that credit card, you needed your social security number. So technically, yes, that can help your personal credit. It does absolutely nothing for your business credit. Okay? So you could have a business credit card with American Express for, ten, for the last 10 years. Didn't do a darn thing for you. Uh, if you want to see – one thing that you have to do, and I'm going to go into the next page – one thing that you have to do um, is go to Dun & Bradstreet online, D-U-N Bradstreet. Uh, I think the next chart actually has it. Here, do this now. Get a, a Dun & Bradstreet account, and that is specifically for businesses. And the second you open that up, it starts filtering all the different things that happen to do with your business and interaction with vendors and things like that. Right now, uh, actually, I, I tested this out. I have a local bank called PNC Bank. And I went up to them and I said, do you do a business credit card? They're actually, they, not only did they, uh, they, they have a business credit card, but nothing secured or anything else like that. And the, and the reason I asked them was to find out whether or not it actually does anything for business credit. Chase right now does have a business credit card that will improve your business credit. And Wells Fargo actually has a business credit card that will improve your business credit. Well, why would you want business credit? Well, business credit. You know, you, you could open up a, a credit card and get a $10,000 limit, $5,000 limit. Developing good business credit means you can get $100,000, $200,000 of business credit. That could be seriously helpful to you when it comes time to buy your building, when it comes time to make large equipment purchases. Uh, you know, if you've ever tried to renovate, you know, getting your new mats, getting your new walls, getting some, you know, having that in place is amazing as opposed to trying maxing out all of your personal credit cards so that you can buy things, which is very hard for you to write off to begin with. So these are things and assignments that I'm going to be going over because some of the assignments may not have to do with money, but at the end of the day, just because you don't need money now doesn't mean you don't want to set up for the time that you need emergency money. 
So you almost want to set your portfolio in a sense that if 12 months from now you said, I really need to dip into something because uh, certain months were really bad and you talk about the economy, well, now you have something that you could lean on because it was already set up properly. If you've had a, 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 bis you've had a business for 10 years but did absolutely nothing to build your business credit and you're just using uh, a debit card, you're not giving yourself any kind of reward points here, right? It's just like operating out of cash. You need other people, you need other lenders to know that because big ba big banks want to do that. You may want to pitch someone one day and that person really wants to see your records and he wants to know how responsible for you are. So you don't want to act like a teenager where they're only using whatever they have in the bank account. They want to know how responsible you are with this kind of money as well. Now I'm not going out there saying rack up credit card bills. I'm just saying for the people who don't know how to be able to get um, financial uh, assistance, you have to start setting it up early, otherwise you're just going to wind up waiting. And uh, if you've already been in business, there's no point in waiting for that. Uh, so, for example, you can get a secured um, uh, you can get a secured business card and just say, "Hey, I'm putting a couple thousand dollars in a secured card," and you're actually putting money in. And where did that money come from? Hey, you know that second holding company where it's keeping all that net money? Well, if the money was always there for you to spend, we all know that you would spend it. Well, instead of spending it, you take that net money and put it into a secured card. You hang out a little bit, and after six months, watch what happens. You know, you have two, three, five thousand dollars in that account. That now all of a sudden you have fifty thousand dollars of usable spending uh, if you have good business credit and you're following some of the things that I'm talking about. If that's useful for you. You should, you know, type something in the box and say, hey, you know what, I think starting right now I have a new financial strategy that I want to look at because there's always a just-in-case fund that I need. And I'm not talking about putting cash in a piggy bank. I'm talking about having the bank take care of it uh, so that you don't have to worry about uh, paying right out of pocket cash and then the money that you spend is the money that you don't have anymore. So these are things that are, uh, should be very, very useful for you. Does anyone have any questions with regards to some of the tips that I just gave you? I, I kind of gave something with regards to LLCs. I kind of gave something with regards to having multiple companies. I gave something a little bit about uh, having some financial strategies going on. Does any, anyone have any questions that they'd like to share? And right now, just to let you know, the two that I can actually confirm that they will help are, is Chase and Wells Fargo. The Bank of America, as big as they are, their business credit card does not help your business credit. It just lets you spend from your business checking account. Um, great. Oh, good. A lot of feedback. And again, you know, contact me separately after this. Uh, you should be able to hit me up on Facebook, or if you've gotten this, you know how to be able to contact me. But this is going to be this will be uh, very helpful for you. The two companies will they be different names? Absolutely, they will be two totally different names. Um, you know what the names are are irrelevant. You know, if the first one was called, you know. Uh, I don't know, New Jersey kickboxing, and, and that was your operational, and your second one was literally called whatever, uh, Tenafly Holding Company. What's going to happen is every time you open up a company, uh, there's a description of the company. So you could actually say that there's a pass-through function that this is going to have, and you have memos, and this is why you have your minutes, and th this is actually why the company exists. So for example, uh, I have a company just for um, just for my IP, my intellectual property. So because I have a curriculum, uh, the properties of the curriculum, the brand logos, the trademarks is held by a company. The company does absolutely nothing but be responsible for holding that. So just for me to even sell the curriculum, I have to have an agreement with my crew IP company to say Ace Ramirez is allowed to teach the program held by crew IP. So that's how much I try and layer myself to protect. So all those guys that are stealing um, images from our logo and using the name illegally, this and that, and I go, trust me, I have some good lawyers. So you better be careful out there. So you know, as much padding as that is possible because you're going to say, well, it's not important right now. Uh, I'm not a big company. You never try and treat your business like you're not a big business. You have to protect yourself at all times. Sometimes when you're a smaller business, that's the that's the business everybody wants to go after because they don't think you have protection. When it's a big business, some people don't even bother going after them because they absolutely know they have all these lawyers to protect them. Your job is to act like a big company. Your job is to protect yourself, but you have to do it properly. And if you can do it properly and you have the right advisors around you, then all you have to do is work. It would be a beautiful day if all you could do is just wake up, go to work, and go home. 
sometimes we get different challenges and that's what kind of kills us a little bit. All right, let's see some more feedback here. Excellent. Would you advertise the second name? No. Not at all. The, actually, you don't even really advertise the first name because there's a lot of companies, their DBA isn't the name of their real business, right? The, the, like, for example, you could actually be called Tenafly Martial Arts LLC, but the name on the wall says Crew Training. So Crew Training could be the DBA, and your LLC could be named something completely different. There's no reason to advertise it. It's really more of an accounting thing. And because of that accounting thing, you actually have this legal shelter, uh, legal uh, layer of protection that exists. So it's accounting because it's a matter of your money or your assets go somewhere, so you tell your accountant about it. But technically, your, your legal counsel is the one that had set it up for you. Don't, don't you. You could definitely set up things online, and they're not that hard. But if you're new at it, you, you definitely want to have someone kind of, like I said, it's a mentor. But in the mentorship, in this sense, is actual legal counsel because you want to make sure it works properly in your state. And here's the other thing. You may not want to have your legal entity created in your state. If you're in California, you may not want your company be, to be a California company. If you're, a, um, if you're in New York, you may not want that company created in New York. Does anyone, actually, let me ask you this. What is, uh, what is one of the most sought after uh, states that people will open up a company because they have great protection in? Does anyone know that? Absolutely. Good, good job, Coach Scott. Delaware. It is Delaware. Now, their office is not in Delaware, but they happen to set it up there. This is a whole set of... Uh, 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 a whole different track that's not for part of the topic, but that's something that maybe you just didn't know. So what you didn't know is what you didn't know, but now you do. It makes you investigate your business as as simple as how did I set up my, my company? Can you convert it? Absolutely. Can I be a sole proprietor uh, and convert it to an LLC? 100%. Can I switch it from one state to another? You got to talk to legal counsel. But I'm just saying these are some of the things that you should look at, and maybe you've been open for five years. You opened it uh, you opened up your business, and you just stopped thinking about it. Well, I'm telling you, go back, rethink about everything, and let's start from scratch and do it the right way with more experienced eyes. Okay, guys? So uh, we've pretty much run out of time. It's, it's been the hour. I've given you uh, some 14 tips to do in 2014, but at the same time, I've given you an idea of what we're going to be doing in our mentoring webinars. So these are some of the topics that we would be going after. And if you're not in the mentoring group, there are certain things that we can be able to do uh, that I consider as business basics. This has nothing to do with martial arts. This has nothing to do with fitness. It has nothing to do with Muay Thai. It's just about running a business properly. So if you know somebody else, they could, be, they could own a bakery. They could own a car wash. If you think somebody might be... Uh, Benefiting from this, please let me know. We can get them part of that program. We do have the webinar uh, uh, specialty. For those that are well-established with larger staff and, and, and uh, maybe they have uh, a lot of clients, large staff, and multi-locations, you, you really def definitely want to contact me about our alliance group, Mastermind Alliance. Uh, the crew mentorship group is going well beyond a crew Muay Thai program. It's not just about running a test or an open house. This is really more about the business side of it. Uh, maybe you have to ask yourself basic things. What percentage of monthly recurring tuition versus merchandise sales should you be producing? How much do you pay for your staff? Um, how do you break off commissions? Can you do it without having to give them commissions? If these are questions that you have, the crew mentoring program would be perfect for you because these are the things that maybe are not important today, but they will be very important when you start growing your business. And the thing is, please don't tell I had a conversation, I think, last night with someone who's on this webinar, and I was talking about starting the business and they said okay well 15 years down the line we could have a plan and do this I go 15 it's more like two or three years you know there's no reason to wait if you have the right tools you get right to work and what I'm gonna try and do is make sure that I can give you all the tools because a lot of people can grow a business not a lot can sustain a business uh, everybody loves Apple everybody loves iPod well right now they're just saying how, how tired uh, Apple is. Some people might hate me for this, but it's kind of true. They're like, hey, it's kind of the same thing. Samsung is starting to kick their butt right now. So they've had, you know, Microsoft was hot, and then Apple became hot. And then all of a sudden, Samsung's coming in with different software and technology. So there's a certain way you could be king of the hill, but you're not king of the hill because you're king of the hill. You're king of the hill because you're anticipating somebody's ready to kick your butt. Um, you could be champion for so long, and there's a guy waiting in the wings, ready to be hungry, because they, they were doing some of these tips too. They were checking out the competition, They're, and you were their competition. They were seeing what you were lacking, and then they wound up putting it into their 
their product or their service and they're right on the heels of, of passing you. So um, again, monthly webinars, weekly assignments, financial strategies, important operational protocol, pitching for money, how many people out there could use more money for their business? Honestly, I was in front of Damon John uh, from uh, Shark Tank uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, worked with his team. He's my mentor. I'm, you know, he, he's someone who shows me what I should be doing in the martial arts business. He was known in the garment business, but he's not just in the garment business. He's a true entrepreneur. He's an East Coast, uh, for the most part, he's a New York guy, so he's kind of an East Coast guy, very relatable to me. I like him. We've had great discussions. I work with his staff, and I have very cool things coming up for crew for 2014, and I want to be able to pass some of those things along to you, and I think that it's a great time and, and great effort to do it. Uh, there are academies that are out there, and you know his academy was 1500 bucks just to show up for a couple hours. And then that wasn't anything to continue on. That was just to be able to show up and, and get some information. Hopefully, our program here is much more affordable for you, and uh, we're going to custom tailor it for you. So the webinar special is $199 a month for that. You could do a single payment for $1997, so you're saving almost $400. hate to sound like I'm pitching, but you know some people have been asking me about this. And the last part is you heard about the mastermind. The mastermind is $500 for four sessions. You get four live tra training sessions. It's five hundred dollars a month, so that's six thousand dollars for a year. Or each session is fifteen hundred dollars to come in for that live training. Well, I'll tell you what: for those that are doing their one payment of nineteen ninety seven, not only going to save your three ninety one, but we're going to give you one mastermind live training meeting that you're able to attend as well. So that nineteen ninety seven, you're almost getting all of that for free, in addition to just joining for the mentoring program. So what's happening next, guys? Um, at the end of January, just a couple weeks from now, uh, 24th to 26th, on Friday, I am having a Crew Muay Thai training session. Uh, if you're not a member of Crew, contact me. You can train with us for the day. Uh, there's going to be business training sessions and, and on-hands workshops for three days. Contact me. It's about $45 for the, for the week pass. There's tournaments. There's fights. There's an awards banquet, all sorts of stuff that are going on. Uh, you can contact us at the phone number at below, and below is our staff email. You can contact Coach Gian at HQ at gmail. And I don't have a date for the retreat. I kind of posted online um, with regards to the, by the way, the crew retreat is for anybody. It's not curriculum. Students can come. Anybody can come. Uh, we we're trying to nail down whether we we're looking at something like at the Poconos or at Florida or something affordable where we could bring you know, family members with. So go to my wall. Actually, if, if anybody's interested in doing a training retreat for Muay Thai, uh, it's just to have fun, guys. Uh, go up to my wall and start to, you know, post on my wall and think of, start telling me where you would like to show up. You know, uh, maybe it's California, maybe it's Hawaii, maybe it's on a cruise ship. Uh, start putting some stuff down there and we'll start compiling and I'll get dates as soon as possible. So if you say, hey, listen, I'd love to be able to do it in ju uh, July, uh, once I know when everybody can do it, I'd love to be able to do it. Also, go to my wall on Facebook and post what you thought of this, uh, you know, the tips that I've been giving you today, if it was helpful or not. That gives me a lot of feedback and lets me know that I can do some more of these. But I'm, I'm starting next week, I'm going to have that mentoring webinar uh, with a lot more detail and weekly assignments too. Let's see. Let's see. Will there be crew curriculum? Yes. Coach Dio, uh, we're going to have them almost every quarter, if not every three months, we're having something. I've, I have stuff scheduled in Texas. I have stuff scheduled in Florida. I'm seeing if I can schedule something in California. If not California, it might be on the west side of Canada. And I'm also looking to be in the UK as well as Australia. Um, but as far as having New Jersey training, yes, we're going to have New Jersey training again. Most likely, we're going to have something in March. If, if it's not in January, we're going to try and do something in March. And maybe every two, three months, we're going to have something as well. Let's see. Awesome. Which part of Texas? San Antonio. San Antonio. I believe San Antonio is going to be in July. So we'll see. Let's see. Canada's too cold. So is Jersey right now, sir. <laughs> Let's see. 
Uh, awesome, guys. Well, if you guys have any other questions, please post it. Otherwise, we'll sign off because I know some people have some places to go right now. If not, uh, if you missed any of this, I'm going to try and have this as part of a recording. So if you need this um, uh, sent to you, please let me know, and I'll, I'll uh, take care of that for you. Please hit me back if uh, you want to be a part of the mentoring program or the alliance program or if you want to come to Atlantic City for one day. And I hope to see you guys online. Please hit me up on Facebook. If that's it, everyone, please have a great day. And let me see if there's one more. Okay, awesome, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Absolutely, Mr. Mercado. You can be able to get a recording. Just uh, send it to me by an email or, or by Facebook. Awesome. Thank you, Coach Cheryl. Have a good day, guys. Take care.